welcome. My name is Chuck Miller. I'm uh, chairman of the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission. Uh, and on behalf of the Cleveland Heights Historical Society and the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission, I welcome you to the uh, Superior Schoolhouse, otherwise known as the Cleveland Heights Historical Center. Um, we are going to have a really interesting presentation tonight, but before I get into that, I want to make a few announcements. Um, on November 6th here, which is not too far away, just a couple of weeks, uh, Dr. Marion Morton, one of our local residents, um, is going to be here talking about her brand new book um, on the uh, history of Cleveland Heights, and uh, she will be specifically um, targeting that, that presentation, the history and evolution of the Severance Estate property. Uh, and I don't know if a lot of you know about it, but this book has just uh, been published and um, it's available at Apple Tree Books. In fact, the people from Apple Tree will be here to sell the books as well, and Marion will be here to, uh, to sign those books for us. Um, in future months, there will be a display by the Cleveland Heights Historical Society here and probably at other locations uh, as part of our membership, membership drive uh, for this year. Uh, it will be a display illustrating all of the numerous properties and districts of Cleveland Heights that are on the National Register of Historic Places, and I think there are a lot more of them than you may realize. So we're looking forward to that display as well. Um, tonight's presentation is titled Euclid Township 1796 to 1801, the protest in the Western Reserve. Our presenters tonight are Dr. Roy Larrick and Dr. Craig Semsel. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about these two gentlemen. Dr. Roy Larrick reconstructs intercontinental historical human migrations based, archaeological, based on archaeological evidence. Uh, sounds like a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> he has directed archaeological field projects in Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. His publications include major papers in Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and World Archaeology, as well as chapters in humanities-oriented edited volumes. Dr. Larrick's archaeological pursuits always bring him back to the early migrations from New England to the Western Reserve. This devotion has taken him to research buildings and architectural documents at historic Deerfield and Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, and the Fairfield Historical Society in Connecticut, as well as Western Reserve Historical Society. Resulting papers identify the transfer of New England architectural principles at the dawn of the 19th century. In teaming with Dr. Samsell, Dr. Larrick has brought a completion of a long-held long held desire to understand the first several years of Euclid's history from the perspective of Moses Cleveland's protesting surveyors. Dr. Craig Samsell received his MS in Applied History, a variant of public history at Carnegie Mellon University and his PhD from Case Western Reserve University. While studying street railways, Dr. Samsell served in professional and voluntary capacities at transportation museums in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Dr. Samsell has published several articles on his work and is writing a monograph. During his time in Cleveland, Dr. Samsell volunteered and later became an employee of the Euclid Historical Museum. In his seven years there, he oversaw all aspects of the museum's operation and wrote numerous articles on Euclid's history for the Euclid Historical Society's newsletter. Dr. Samsell is now doing the primary research on the history of Euclid's shoreline. The two co-authors will use this research to complete a well-illustrated book-length monograph by the end of the year of 2003. Um, having said all of that, we welcome everyone here. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a short question and answer period. Uh, but without further ado, I look forward to their presentation. Good evening. We're very pleased to be here tonight. On the, I'm starting too quickly. On the eve of the uh, Ohio Bicentennial, and this is important for us, the history we talk about tonight precedes the Ohio Bicentennial by a number of years. We're here tonight to talk about the 18th century of Cleveland Heights, would you believe it? Uh, but not as you know it, as we all know it as Cleveland Heights, but as Euclid Township. Tonight, Dr. Semsel and I, uh, we want to take you back on this place more than 200 years, and uh, we want to attempt to show you how it came about. It's a very interesting history, 
that we have between 1796 and about 1801. And uh, we'll divide this in two halves. Dr. Semsel will take the first half and tell you of the history, Moses Cleland and the protesting surveyors. And then I will come back and uh, tell you about the historical legacy, what is left from these very interesting final years of the 18th century in Cleveland Heights. Now, in return for our work with you tonight, uh, we ask you to do one thing, and that is to conceive of your hometown here, Cleveland Heights, as something a little larger. And that is as part of Euclid Township, which is uh, in these red lines here. And the old western border of Euclid Township is here at about East 140th Street, and heading down toward Cleveland Heights to intersect Cedar Road at uh, Demington, okay? Going due east on Cedar to, if you can imagine it, Irene Road in Lyndhurst, which doesn't come out at Cedar, but that area, and then due north more than nine miles to the lake at the Cuyahoga Lake County line, uh, which is East 283rd Street in the city of Euclid. Now, we are here, we're up here from that flatland suburb down there, the city of Euclid, that vague thing to the north. <clears throat> and we're standing here in the Superior Schoolhouse in the Highlands, but it's all Euclid Township. We want to stress that. The history that we give you tonight is as much the history of Cleveland Heights as it is the city of Euclid. The city of Euclid carries that name, but the township was a very large place and in fact, you'll understand why its great size uh, contributed to its early history. Now, before we get started, I have a, I uh, wanna say, first of all, that we are here uh, with generous support of the o Ohio Humanities Council and also with support from Euclid Community Television. And uh, maybe we can get Cleveland Heights Television on that as well. Uh, before getting into the real history, I'd like to give you some history of the history. Now, this is more than 200 years old. That's old. I spent a lot of time in Europe, and the late 18th century is old even in the parts of France uh, where I work. So I'm very proud that we have this 18th century history, but it comes to us in a rather complex way. We have had great fortune, Dr. Semsel and I, in working with original Connecticut Land Company documents um, that exist in Cleveland at the Western Reserve Historical Society. And these documents have lain there for more than 150 years. And there are two people that we would like to cite as instrumental in bringing these documents to Cleveland from Connecticut and then bringing them to the public. And one is a man that uh, some of you may know. He's a hero of mine. I'm an archeologist and Charles Whittlesey uh, in the 1850s and 60s was an accomplished archeologist historian. And um, I'd like to pattern my life a little after his. In any event, he and a number of prominent Clevelanders went to Hartford, Connecticut in the early 1860s and they convinced the state legislature and a number of other uh, governmental organizations to give them the, all the documents of the Connecticut Land Company, which they brought back here and upon which they established the Western Reserve Historical Society. And uh, Mr. Whittlesey was the first president and served for more than 20 years there. <clears throat> so certainly Charles Whittlesey is important. He also wrote a book, you see the title page there, Early History of Cleveland, a real classic, in which he mentions the early history of Euclid Township and he lays out the documentation for it, but he never goes very much farther than that. Uh, but he is one person who got us on our way. And another person is uh, a city of Euclid resident from the, 19, from the early part of this century, Wilma P. Stein, who graduated from Western Reserve College, Mather College, in 1937. And that was the first year in which Mather College required a BA thesis and honors thesis for, uh, uh, for their, their graduating uh, young women. And Ms. Stein chose to do one on the early history of Euclid. And she patterned it much like Whittlesey's book. Uh, but it is Ms. Stein who 
1937, actually traced a few of the late 18th century, early 19th century documents relating to the township. In particular, two maps that got us going on this. I won't say very much about this, except that this map, this map is a tracing of a map that's unfortunately lost and it dates to September 30th, 1796, the result of Moses Cleveland and 41 protesters sitting on the banks of the Cuyahoga trying to come up with something they would call Euclid Township. And uh, fortunately, we have some other documents that are equally important, uh, but not quite that old. The other one, another one that we have here is what the township became in, uh, by 1802, and uh, I will again say that we are at this moment actually right there at the Superior Schoolhouse in this little square right there. All right, <clears throat> with this I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Semsel to give you the history of the first six years of Euclid Township. Okay, I'm gonna back up just a little bit in uh, what I'm gonna be presenting. Um, Roy, being an archaeologist, if he was going to do this for you, he'd take you back several hundred million years. But uh, <laughs> I'm a historian, and the way I like to tell it, I start in 1631. Mm -hmm. In that year, King James I uh, conferred a, a series of western lands to what would become the colony of Connecticut. Uh, this was nothing unusual. He did this for other colonies, and uh, no one thought much of it at the time. It became a serious issue, however, in the 1780s. Uh, if you'll remember from uh, history books and such, uh, from our history classes, in the 1780s we had fought for and won our independence from uh, Great Britain, and uh, we were uh, governed under something known as the Articles of Confederation. Well, they didn't work. And in 1787 there was a, a convention held in Philadelphia to try to rectify the situation. In the uh, process of developing what became our present Constitution, the issue of Western land claims came up. And this was something that uh, had to be resolved. Ultimately, for Connecticut, it was resolved by allowing the state to retain a landmass roughly equivalent to its own size uh, just west of Pennsylvania. Let me take a look at our first slide. Come on, that. You can see the, uh, around the area marked Cleveland. That's uh, largely what is known as the uh, Connecticut Western Reserve. In 1793, the uh, Connecticut General Assembly and decided to sell the entire Western Reserve as one parcel at one time. A group of 57 investors, uh, most if not all of them from Connecticut, uh, joined together and formed what is known as the Connecticut Land Company. And it's the Connecticut Land Company documents that Dr. Lerick and I uh, went through as we uh, did our research. They purchased this land in 1795 for the price of $1.2 million. Uh, that's when $1.2 million was $1.2 million. Certainly not, you couldn't get that much for it today. I'd uh, be lucky if you buy some houses for $1.2 million today. Uh, anyway, in uh, January of 1796, the company engaged uh, General Moses Cleveland. I think we have a portrait of him as well. There's the gentleman. Looks like a nice chap to do business with. Uh, Moses Cleveland was hired in January of 1796 to accomplish three things. He was given two years to, first of all, uh, con uh, confirm local settlement uh, treaties with Indians that were residing in the area. Secondly, the reserve was to be divided up into a series of townships, each township being roughly 25 miles square. The uh, next thing he was supposed to do was select sites for prominent townships, including one that would serve as the capital of this new Connecticut, as they were calling it at the time. Uh, in his second year, he was to allot the estimated uh, 200 townships, uh, get them all together and prepared for public and commercial sale. If we take a look at our next image, uh, spring of 1796, he conferred with uh, local Mohawk and Seneca uh, uh, officials. I don't know if it looked quite like that, but that's a <laughs> nice view that we have of it. And uh, by the summer of 1796, uh, General Cleveland and the surveyors set to work, and they ran into problems almost immediately. The first and most alarming of which had to do with the Erie shoreline. If we take a look at the uh, map, 
Notice how the shoreline trends to the uh, southwest. It kind of goes down at a diagonal. Well, the Connecticut Land Company was under the impression that it went due west, straight across, which meant there was a substantial amount of land that they thought they had bought that was on the bottom of Lake Erie. That, that was not a good thing. Uh, secondly, they had to re the Connecticut uh, General Assembly had stipulated that they had to take about uh, a half a million acres and set that aside for residents of Connecticut that had suffered property losses during the Revolution. This is where you may have heard of the Firelands. Uh, this is where the Firelands come from. So there's a problem. They only have about 2.76 uh, million acres to sell. They thought they would have four. This was a problem. Uh, a bigger problem comes over toward the east. Uh, in the eastern uh, townships, they found there was a lot of sedimentary rock just beneath the surface. Poor drainage, uh, even worse soil conditions. Uh, they found a lot of wetlands as well. Uh, something they weren't anticipating. How would you like to be a surveyor trying to slog through that with your chains and such? It must have been quite a big surprise to them. Uh, another problem was uh, 1796 was a particularly uh, rainy summer. Uh, so a lot of what you're seeing here would have been exaggerated in 1796. And uh, also there was a form of malaria that they, many of the uh, Connecticut Land Company officials or surveyors had contracted. Uh, if you go to the Western Reserve Historical Society, there are diaries from some of these surveyors, and you can read as they talk about their comrades uh, getting sick and falling ill. In some cases, the people keeping the diaries will describe their own symptoms as they fell ill themselves. It's uh, rather gruesome reading, but it does uh, emphasize some of the problems that were encountered. Whole upshot of this is uh, by uh, September of 1796, uh, the surveyors are upset. 41 of the party are very upset. They don't think they're being paid enough, they think the conditions are absolutely horrible, and they tell Moses Cleveland on no uncertain terms that they are not coming back for their second year of work, and uh, they just want to be done with the whole thing. Cleveland is a quick thinker, and he says, wait a minute, don't do that. We can, we can, we, we can talk about this, we can reason this out. And uh, proposes a settlement for them. They can purchase any township in the Western Reserve that they want, anyone. They'll divide this, uh, there's 41 protesters, this township will be divided equally among the 41 protesters and they can purchase the land at the bargain price of a dollar an acre. The choice was theirs. And they decided that they would take him up on his offer, so they looked at the uh, townships and they noticed immediately, immediately to the uh, East of Cleveland was Township 8 in the 11th range. This was, uh, by any measure, you just heard uh, Roy talking about it, how large it was. It was, in fact, the largest township in the Western Reserve, some 36 acres all told. 36 uh, acres, square miles. Acres, square miles. I'm history, I'm not math. Hmm. Anyway, okay. Uh, where was I? Uh -huh. There was also a settlement plan. Cleveland had a great plan. They would divide up into three groups and they would have the entire township settled in about three years. By the end of, by December 1799, all 41 settlers would be on the, on the property. The uh, various lots would be uh, divided randomly so no one would feel slighted and that was what, uh, that was how they left matters. Now in 1797, uh, the survey is taken over by a different gentleman, a man by the name of Seth Pease. We have an image of him, yeah, there's Seth. And under his direction, uh, surveyors Charles Parker and Joseph Landon set out to uh, survey township uh, T8R11, township eight in the 11th range. By the way, in September, they gave it a name. They called it Euclid. They named it after the Greek mathematician who was the founder of the uh, plane geometry and the surveyor's craft. So in uh, 1797, uh, in June, Charles Parker and Joseph Landon set out to lay out this township as they had agreed in September of uh, September previous. It's typical of most 18th century surveys. In the first place, there was the technology they used. Uh, they used a compass. We know they used a compass because if you go to the Western Reserve Historical Society, uh, Parker and Landon's survey notes are still there perfectly preserved. If you want to see them, you can go there yourselves. You won't be ushered to the microfilm room. You'll be ushered to the manuscript table. You will actually be handed a folder containing the actual leaves that Parker and Landon took with them through Euclid 
uh, over 200 years ago, about the size of a legal sheet of a paper. There's 19 pages in all, very tiny, minuscule handwriting, and all done in ink. I'm very envious of that. They took all their notes as they laid out uh, Euclid Township. We know they used a compass because there are compass bearings in the notes. They also used the surveyor's chain. A chain is 66 feet long, comprised of 100 links. Each link is 7.92 inches long. Uh, that's for all you trivia buffs out there. Um, any dimensions that you find in Parker and Landon's notes will be given to you in chains and links. They marked uh, trees where convenient, uh, but for the most part they favored uh, laying stakes and setting posts, marked posts telling you the corners of each lot and where each lot was located. The other thing they did was, uh, as they set things out, uh, they created a plat. They, uh, something else that surveyors would do, they also made sure that they had on paper a graphic representation of what they were doing to make sure that uh, they had everything together. Uh, they began doing all of this at the beginning of June and they were finished by the end of the month. If we take a look at our next, uh, this is a schematic showing you roughly how they divided up uh, Euclid Township. Uh, again, each of the 41 protesters was given an equal amount of land. There are these narrow lake lots you see right along the lake shore. They kind of look like piano keys. They were given two square lots. That's the squarish portion of the township down below. And then this large triangle in between the square and the lake lots. This is something the surveyors call a gore and you were given one lot each uh, in the gore. They were determined randomly again, and as Parker and Landon went along, uh, they, uh, they had all the lake lots laid out uh, by the 11th of June. They had the gore lots done uh, by about the 20th of June, and then by uh, July 1st, they had all the square lots uh, laid out. Uh, that's several hundred miles of line that they had to lay, and I forget how many posts and stakes, but it also numbers in the hundreds. Very ambitious individuals. As they went along, they made notes uh, describing the terrain, noting what species of trees were in the area. Uh, Roy had mentioned that you're down in the lower southwest uh, corner. Uh, that's where we are sitting today. 200 years ago, you'd be happy to know that uh, most trees that they found were uh, oak and chestnut. Occasionally, they uh, took the bother to say white oak. But it seems that the two types of trees that you would find mostly in the Cleveland Heights 200 years ago were chestnut and oak. Uh, soil was rather fascinating. Uh, you had every type of soil condition uh, imaginable. It went from good soil to uh, middling soil to rocky soil. There were at least three rivers or small streams running through the property and at least one deep river run uh, that they had talked about. <laughs> So that was the plan. It was laid out in 1797. Uh, later on that summer, the first settlers were supposed to be arriving, and by the end of 1799, everyone should be living on their allotted ground. Well, in 1801, a grand total of four of the 41 protesters are living in Euclid, one of whom just owns the land in Euclid but doesn't actually live there. Two other individuals, a man by the name of Dilly and a man by the name of John Moss, whom Roy will be talking about a little later, are also settled on the property. But what went wrong? How could you have this great, fantastic plan for 41 people to come onto the property and uh, then nobody? There's a number of factors that uh, Roy and I discovered in our research. First of all, limited natural resources. Yes, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of trees and such, but uh, only one middling site uh, that was described for uh, a mill very little in the way of salt flows. There was a harbor at the uh, mouth of Euclid Creek, but wasn't large enough for, uh, to encourage large enough development or settlement. Uh, there was no chance of Euclid becoming a, a county seat. Uh, it was right next to Cleveland, and that had been established as the capital of a new Connecticut. Very few social institutions uh, emerge in a early Euclid township. The first Baptist church doesn't happen along until 1820, whereas there were other townships in the Western Reserve that had them as early as 1802. There was no dramatic, dynamic leadership among the surveyors. Nobody stepped forward uh, with a vision of how this place was to come together, how it was to be settled, how they were to govern themselves. Uh, they didn't even form a committee. Uh, they just let it go. Uh, most importantly, however, you have to remember these were surveyors we're talking about. Uh, they were signed on with the Connecticut Land Company to do a brief job, two years, 
and that was it. They would come back to New England, and they would be done with it. This idea sounds fine when tempers are running hot and uh, you're under the spell of Moses Cleveland, but when you come home to your hearth and uh, your family and things are nice and comfortable there and cozy in Connecticut, you start to think, do I really want to go all the way back to I don't know. No. So they had second thoughts. In 1801, the Connecticut Land Company takes these 164 lots that you see here, they re-divide them into 20 larger lots, and it's there that uh, Euclid uh, Township, as we know it, uh, in the city of Euclid, as we know it today, started to form, and you start to see splintering uh, groups and uh, smaller uh, municipalities being formed, uh, such as Cleveland Heights. But the story doesn't quite end there. These people did leave us a legacy, and they did leave us a remnant. And I'm going to turn over the uh, floor to Roy, and he'll tell you what we can see today that reminds us of what happened uh, 200 years ago. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> My interest in this is what is left over from these five or six or seven very early years. Um, the name, Euclid, for the township, but the township really doesn't exist anymore. So we have South Euclid and Euclid. Um, we have Euclid Creek, okay? That's a major watercourse. It's a middle-sized stream for the Western Reserve, but uh, still an important watercourse within the township here. Uh, we have what we call Euclid Avenue now. It used to be called the Buffalo Road. Um, that uh, is uh, a small legacy of this time. Um, but there is quite a bit more, and I'd like to show you three items uh, that we know today that uh, date from these earliest years. And the first one I've labeled as prehistoric trails. Well, obviously, prehistory, those predate the Connecticut Land Company, the surveyors here. But the surveyors did note some prehistoric trails, and uh, I'd like to tell you a bit about that. Another one is Moss Point, and uh, Craig mentioned John Moss, one of the very first residents of Euclid along the lake shore. A, one of the two geographic features that has a name in Euclid. Euclid Creek is one, and the slight bulge in the Lake Erie shoreline is Moss Point. And finally, uh, probably most interesting for us today, is a number of roads that you'll see, you'll recognize quite quickly, date back to 1796 and 1797. Not the roads themselves, but the survey lines placed in 1797 that shortly thereafter gave rise to these roads. Now, let's look at Euclid once in the eastern, oh, I'm having trouble, eastern western reserve, Euclid, right here, next to Cleveland. And you see as Craig said, these other townships were designed to be 25 square miles, five miles on an edge. Um, and they, the surveyors ran into problems along the Lake Erie shore that trended and along the Cuyahoga River that trended. In these areas, they came up with partial townships. Usually, these stood on their own, or in a certain few cases, when you had very small ones like this, they were joined to the southern township along Lake Erie. But Euclid, Euclid has a gore, that is a triangular shape, that is nearly half the size of a full township. Euclid was defined as Township 8 in Range 11, but the surveyors added this to it to get themselves a township of not 25 square miles, but 36 square miles, by far the largest in the Western Reserve. This is a very important reason uh, for this choice here. <clears throat> now, I have this map uh, which shows you the basic lay of the land. And we think of this area as basically a flat land, but it really is not. I have the uh, contour line shaded by 100 feet. So for every 100 feet, there's a, a line and a change in color. Um, there is nearly 700 feet of rise from Lake Erie to the southern southeastern corner uh, bordering with Highland Heights here. And uh, 700 feet is not much for us as we drive around on the interstates, on the roads that we know. They've all been ameliorated. We never climb, we never descend too quickly. But you can imagine walking uh, from the shore of Lake Erie up to, well, let's say up to Demington, and uh, coming up 
400, 500 feet or so. If you're driving an ox, if you're riding a horse or pulling a wagon, that's a sizable grade to come up. So early roads were very important. And uh, on this slide, I've added some of the streams so we can orient ourselves a little better to understand how some of the roads went. Once again, we have this trend of the lakeshore from southwest to northeast, very steep. And you notice that the contours basically parallel the lakeshore. And then the streams are basically perpendicular, perpendicular to the lakeshore. Euclid Creek here with its side branch parallel. Uh, the ones that are important for us tonight are Dugway Brook coming up, I'm sorry, Dugway Brook here coming up into Cleveland Heights and Nine Mile Creek coming up here and then Euclid Creek. Those are the major streams of Euclid Township. And I'm sorry, I've done this wrong again. My angle is a little strange here. Dugway Brook into Cleveland Heights, Nine Mile Creek into Cleveland Heights, and then Euclid Creek into South Euclid. <clears throat> now, one of, the, one of our very interesting discoveries at the Western Reserve Historical Society was <clears throat> a very early map that shows you exactly how this was divided up, and I won't spend very much time on this, but I, I want you to see, I hope, whoops, well, I'll just go to this one. It shows it better anyway. Along the lake shore, if you can notice, these lake lots that Craig talked about, as they proceed from 1 to 41 across the lake shore here, the first ones are fairly wide and the last ones are fairly wide, but in this area, they're, they narrow down. Well, why is that? The way they calculated this, they ran a line parallel to the lake shore. The surveyors ran this line. They decided on this line arbitrarily, and then they would define equal-sized lots. Well, in the summer of 1796, they had surveyed a slight bulge in the shoreline here, and as the bulge went out into the lake, they narrowed the lots, so everybody would have 84 <laughs> acres. Okay, this becomes important in a little while. But now back to these natural roads. And here we go. One of our great discoveries was this map of the original grid system for Euclid Township, September 1796, June 1797, that had these lines on it. And it took us a few minutes to realize that these lines are the prehistoric trails of Euclid Township. And from the lake south, we see just a bit of Lake Road or Lakeshore Boulevard, which is a historical trail running the length of Lake Erie along the shore. St. Clair on a beach ridge, on an Ice Age beach ridge, and then the Buffalo Road or the Euclid Road here. Okay, those are pretty clear. Down here we have Mayfield Road, which does not follow any of the grid lines. It kind of winds its way as Mayfield, was, Mayfield Road does. But the ones that are most interesting for Cleveland Heights here are, uh, we have Lee Road, we have Coit Taylor, and we have Ivanhoe Noble up to Mayfield. Okay? Those were on the ground in June of 1797. These are prehistoric trails used both by animals, large mammals, and by prehistoric Native Americans. Okay. Now, a couple of other ones that are not in Cleveland Heights but are very important for the region. We go up to Euclid Creek, and on the west bank, southwest bank of Euclid Creek, we have Nottingham to Dilly to Euclid Avenue, then Highland coming up and finally joining the grid system as it trends east into Richmond Heights. On the east or north side of Euclid Creek, this isn't very accurate right here on this map, is Neff Road, Chardon Road, coming across Euclid Avenue and up onto the hill this way, okay? So a system of roads or trails they found when they came here. They, these existed and are certainly prehistoric. Now, <clears throat> to trace those modern, to trace those trails out presently, uh, I hope you can see this. Very clear is Mayfield along here through Cleveland Heights. Cedar is the big one, of course. And then, if I can do it from this angle, 
Can I do it from this angle? Yeah. Superior, Lee, Dugway Brook, Superior on the west side, Lee on the east side of, of at least the east branch of Dugway Brook. Uh, we have Taylor and Coit going down to the mouth of Euclid Creek. The first records of Coit Road say that it ended at a grindstone dock uh, at the bank of the lake. And then Noble. And then we have Nottingham, Dilly, and Sh uh, Neff and Chardon up here. Okay, so these stay with us today. Now, I'd like to talk about this interesting history of John Moss and Moss Point. And there's a bit of a story here. <laughs> the, uh, when the survey party, Moses Cleveland, came out in the spring of 1796, they met another group of people out here. They met another group of explorers and surveyors. And they came from another land company that had actually competed for a while with the Connecticut Land Company. And um, this, uh, this other company <clears throat> was called the Canandaigua Land Company. And it was run primarily by a Connecticuter named Oliver Phelps, who was also the major investor in the Connecticut Land Company. But before that latter one came together and actually purchased the land, Oliver Phelps and his Canandaigua country, centered along Canandaigua Lake in New York State, had attempted to purchase the Western Reserve. They had gone so far as to hire a French cartographer to get the notes of John Heckvelder, who was a Moravian missionary who had worked extensively in this area. And uh, Oliver Phelps had had a very good map of the Western Reserve made back in 1791 but he never succeeded at that time, only with the Connecticut Land Company. In any event, in the summer of 1796, a group of people came out here, and they were camped on the shore of Lake Erie in the summer of 1796. And uh, there's not too much record of them. We know the surveyors met them. Two surveyors kept good notes of meeting this company this group of people on the lakeshore as they were headed back in October of 1796. And the Connecticut Land Company personnel gave them some provisions to tide them over through the winter. So there was people, there were people living here through the winter of 1796 and 1797 in Euclid Township on the lakeshore. By the next year, after Parker and Landon survey in June 1797, um, <clears throat> Joseph Landon's lake lot gets transferred to a man named John Moss. And we see this very clearly in a map of 1802. This, as Craig mentioned, Euclid in 1801, 1802 gets redivided and uh, the lots get a lot bigger. But the, one of the few remaining lots from the Euclid contract is this lake lot of Joseph Landon, which now has the name, now has the initials J.M. for John Moss. <clears throat> and we see this, here is an expansion of uh, a prior map, and you see that in this area there are broken lines that outline Lake Lot 29, and that's Joseph Landon here, but it's obscured, but it again is J. Moss listed here. And that is in 1797-1798. I bring this up because this name, Moss, gets transferred to this bulge in the Lake Erie shoreline that uh, is the one named feature in the Lake Erie South Shore between Avon Point and Presque Isle, named probably in 1797 or 1798 by one of the earliest residents of Euclid Township who has roots in a competing land company, um, the Canandaigua Company. I f I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that John Moss came from New York State and was with Canandaigua people. <clears throat> All right, now, <clears throat> some of you may know the term Moss Point. It has two, two kinds of significance. You find it on uh, Coast Guard 
and NOAA charts of the Great Lakes, and you'll also find it on early maps of this area. This is a topographic map from 1901, and you see it still has all the old neighborhoods, some of the old neighborhoods listed, of Nottingham, Collinwood, Manhattan Beach, Euclid Beach, Noble, Wycliffe we know, Wycliffe on the Lake, Willow Beach, and Moss Point. This was a settlement in the township up until about the 1930s when the city of Euclid came into existence and the old neighborhoods then fell into disuse. All right, finally, I'll finish up with the grid roads, which I think are the more interesting. <clears throat> now, back to our map. The lay of the land, the streams, and this whole big mass. Surveyed, as we saw, into this grid system. Better picture of it here. And <clears throat> I'd like to show you now how some of these lines become our major north-south routes. Back to this map again, and I've already used this to outline John Moss's lot, but here you see another broken line, and there's just the hint of one right here. It's hard to see, but believe me, it is there. These lines we can see were made along lake lot lines, not along any other distinction. You see how this dotted line continues down into this gore area. All right, this is present East 260th Street. This one is present East 215th Street, which is a small street in the city of Euclid. This is only a fragment of this map. We know of one other fragment of this map, and it's quite clear that they took these original Euclid contract lot lines and extended them down to start making roads. And in the city of Euclid, we come up with the following. East 185th Street on the border between lots 13 and 14. East 200th Street is also one. 215th that I've mentioned on the fragment. 222nd is another one and 260th. And even you all in Cleveland Heights here know of 222nd Street, 260th Street, 185th, and 200th as uh, major roads in the city of Euclid. Now, if we transfer that to the whole township, we come up with the following roads that are based on these very old grid lines. And uh, let's do some of these. Um, as I mentioned, the lake lots were used quite a bit to base roads. 140th Street, 152nd, 156, and then on to 185th and, and up that way. And um, down here, <clears throat> we have Lee Road, we have Taylor Road, and we have Warrensville in this area that are on those 200-year-old grid lines. Over here, we have Irene that I mentioned, which forms in Richmond Heights, the, west, the eastern border of the entire township. Okay. Um, I hope I pronounced this right. Quilliams Road, South Euclid, Cleveland Heights, right here. McFarland Road, I don't even know if this exists anymore. Quilliams Road, South Euclid, Cleveland Heights, right here. McFarland Road, I don't even know if this exists anymore. And Ridgebury Road, here, okay. And over here we have, oh, I'm gonna forget it. Let's go up to this one. Let's go to this one, and I'll preface this by saying that we see a lot of lake lot lines made into grid roads. We see quite a number of square lot lines made into grid roads. But if you can visualize into this gore area here, there are very few. In fact, there's only one, and that's the borderline between the square lots and the gore lots. Just one part of it is Holmes Avenue in East Cleveland. Okay? Now, the other east-west ones are then Highland Road, I've mentioned McFarland. Um, honestly, I can't remember what these are off Mayfield here, this little corner. Okay, and the other interesting one to note here is Richmond Road. And this is Richmond Road in its old form. All right, Richmond Road in Euclid comes up east 260th, and uh, it used to make a dog leg here, but this has been smoothed out. It comes up here, and then the road begins on this strange border in the Gore area and it continues down and does not follow the square lot lines until it gets to Mayfield Road, where there used to be a dog leg. And it's a kind of a slant right now that you don't even notice. But there was 
the slant to the right, exactly. There was a dog leg there that then put the southern part of Richmond Road, or at least Richmond Road south of Mayfield, onto a square lot line. Okay. Well, there it is. This is the material. These are the material legacies of the Euclid contract and this flurry of activity from 1796 to 1801. Um, and uh, I'd like to leave this by saying that um, when you drive along any of these roads, realize that they are more than 200 years old, at least in their placement. Thank you. Just a few concluding remarks. And Roy and I were going over this and we were trying to figure out exactly how are we going to end this thing. Uh, <laughs> the obvious way is just to say the end. Um, <laughs> we have to be more creative than that. There's actually two things we can take out of this uh, before we let you go, and thank you very much for your, uh, for your attentiveness. Uh, in the first place, uh, a point that Roy brought up at the very beginning is, uh, remember the size of Euclid Township. Uh, this is not Euclid as we know it today. It's not just shoved up there in the northeast corner of the township. It originally extended all the way out to East 140th Street. You go out to where that uh, filtration or uh, water treatment plant is in that corner. That's it right there, and it comes all the way down to Cedar Road. Think about how many municipalities are within those borders. This isn't just the history of Euclid Township, or the city of Euclid. This is also the history of Cleveland Heights. And uh, just a point that needs to be made. The other point is, again, uh, this whole region has got an 18th century, 18th century heritage. We can trace a lot of what is on the uh, landscape today to things that were around uh, 200 years ago, and even earlier than that. Uh, these grid lines, uh, as they were planned out, was only part of a, uh, really a labor settlement, uh, settling a labor dispute uh, a little over 200 years ago. To lay out all those lines probably took them anywhere from a few hours to perhaps a few days at the most, in late September of 1796. They would probably be quite astonished to find out that it was just a small slice of time in the uh, middle of uh, their hectic lives, it's still around today. Think about that when you're going to do something at home tonight. Think, what did I do that's going to be around here 200 years from now? You might be astonished if you could go ahead 200 years to find out. Oh, my goodness. Uh, also, one survives. Um, but again, that, that heritage is with us. I mean, how many times have we driven down roads that are in that grid? How many of us live on roads that are along that grid? It's absolutely astonishing. I think, Roy, did you have one? Yeah, Roy had one other thing that he wanted to add before we go. But again, thank you very much for your, for your attentiveness. To finally conclude all this, <clears throat> these, uh, the, our presentation tonight is the result of a book, a small book that we've written. And we had hoped to have copies here for you tonight uh, to purchase. But we don't. You know how books go. They get behind. And this one is just about done, but not ready for tonight. The West, we're very fortunate to have the Western Reserve Historical Society publishing uh, our monograph. And uh, we are very happy that um, it will have very good reproductions of these late 18th, early 19th century graphic documents. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we know that this is the first serious research that's been done on Euclid Township in 200 years, and we expect it's going to last for a few decades. So um, I, uh, we would like to take names of uh, anyone who'd like to purchase a book. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd also like to say, quite frankly, that the, the citizens of the city of Euclid have been quite generous with us in, in uh, providing some funds for publishing, for producing this book. And we'd like to have the citizens of Cleveland Heights also support us in some way. For example, if someone would like to see that a number of these books get distributed to Cleveland Heights libraries or schoolrooms, we'd be happy to talk with you about that. Thank you very much. Now, in, in terms of questions, what we'll do is we want to have, since this is going to be recorded for television, we ask that you raise your hand and let us get to you with a microphone. So yes, your question. I'd like to find out whether Oliver uh, Phelps ever got some land out here and what happened to him. All right. Oliver Phelps. I'll take this one because I happen to know Oliver Phelps very well. <clears throat> Oliver Phelps 
came from oh, a town in northern Connecticut, in the Connecticut River Valley. No, I'll think of it in a moment. He was a very wealthy man, and his house in this, this Connecticut River Valley town is quite impressive. Um, he ended up owning quite a few tens of thousands of acres. In Euclid Township itself, he owned a thousand acres. Oliver Phelps was a wealthy man when he started investing in land. He died in pauper's prison in Connecticut. Yeah. Why, he overspeculated, he over and and well, it was it was strictly over speculation that um, this all of these schemes happened just a little too early for the big migration out. You know, in Canandaigua, that was back in the 1780s. That really didn't take off till the 1820s. Here in the Western Reserve, 1796, it didn't get going again till the 1820s or so. And by that time, he was just in too much debt. I'm interested in the, the measurement of the township in terms of, first of all, the concept of township itself, which came from England, but also the way in which the grid is developed and the size of the grid. And one of you mentioned that the chain idea, and there was also something about 25 square miles at some point. Um, what are some of the origins of this uh, without delving too much in mathematics or geometry? Okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, those are two questions, and they're both very interesting. <clears throat> and the first one that's of interest is township. And township actually does not come from England. Town comes from England to New England. You go to New England, nobody speaks of townships. They speak of towns. And towns are... Uh, towns are, uh, once again, coming from England, and those are what you might call organic units. Towns in the New England counties, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and up into Maine, especially the older parts of New England, those towns, I happen to have lived in the town of Deerfield for 12 years, that town was laid out around a river valley in the center, and you might say it had an organic core of this river valley and floodplain, certainly, and then a kind of hinterland for agricultural and woodlot purposes. In any event, you get this kind of circular thing. And ideally, it would be hexagonal and all the towns would fit together, but they'd have a center and a periphery, and they, the periphery would be related to the center. Okay. That was, for us, for, the, for North America, that was a 17th century idea, 18th century idea. But at the end of the 18th century, this idea that we speak of tonight comes along. No, you can't settle Western lands as New Englanders settled New England or Virginians settled Virginia. Uh, a new system would, would come into being, and it was one of these neoclassical ideas, Renaissance neoclassical. You look at the big picture and you divide it up equally. So that's where the idea of township lines, I'm sorry, township lines running east-west, range lines running north-south, a grid system comes, and this term township comes out of that. Now, town is administrative. A town has a town center, a little bit of a government, um, and other social functions. Township for the Connecticut Land Company had nothing to do with that. There were some people who actually did purchase townships. The classic is David Hudson purchased, and he and another group of people purchased Hudson Township. They set up their little town with a town center, and it became the classic Western Reserve town of Hudson, Ohio. All right, but very few of the Western Reserve townships became that because they were strictly township in the sense of township range line and your 25 square miles, you buy it, you do with it what you want, okay? But the idea of town has nothing to do with the concept of township. Most of our yeah. townships have a town in the center. If you look That's at right. Lorraine County in the southern part, right. it hasn't been developed. LaGrange is right in the middle that's right. Township. And there's, there's uh, roads running north, south, east, west. 
That's right. I made an extreme argument there. Yes, when you do look, there are quite a few. But remember, there are, uh, there are more than 200 townships in the whole Western Reserve. You take the number that have town centers, it's several score. And there are more west of the Cuyahoga than east of the Cuyahoga because then they realized that this system wasn't working. The, the first surveyed townships did not have good governments. And when they moved west, and especially into the Firelands, then they got more of the classic township or town organization. But um, um, certainly there are a number. You know, Jefferson, Canfield, yes, there are quite a few that have this organization, but they're small. The thing is, they're small by for agricultural terms. 25 square miles is not enough to have a thriving town center, and that's why many of them are derelict today, those... Uh, those town centers in Western Reserve townships. Okay, now, to answer your second question, <clears throat> the surveying chain is a wonderful device. It happens to be 66 feet long, but it doesn't make any difference that it's 60 feet long. It's 100 chains long, and you put, oh boy, you put 80 of them together and you get a mile. You put 40 of them, to, no, you put, f <laughs> okay. <laughs> you put 400 of them together and you get five miles. Right, 80 of them, a mile, yeah. okay? 400 is five miles, it's easy. You can mark down ticks to 400 and you know you've got your five mile line for a township. So that, that five mile is important at 400 chains, 80 chains is important, 40 chains for defining standard units. A one square mile is a, called a, a um, section and a quarter square mile or one half mile by one half mile is called a quarter section. These were the units that they dealt with and Feet, inches have nothing to do with this. The whole survey of the Western Reserve is in chains, and uh, only, only now, more recently, do surveyors measure in feet and tenths of feet, right? It's never in, in twelfths, never in, in the uh, English system, okay? Right. Everything was. Acres are in twelfths, aren't they? Uh, well, acres. These all work out to acres. Acres goes into the system, and I can't remember off the top of my head how how acres go. But for example, a section is six hundred and forty acres, a square mile. A quarter section, a quarter square mile, is one hundred and sixty acres, and you can break it down like this. Everything was designed to come out to the even chain, but they never came out perfectly from triangulations, so they always dealt in chains and links. Okay. <clears throat> now we start to work hard here. <laughs> um, I have a question. That, it's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, um, were all the lands that were supposedly given to the surveyors, when they have, did they abandon them and then all the land reverted back to the Connecticut Land Company? Right. And then, did, does anything remain of the part of the township that's the lot lines, the lot, the lake lots? Um, yes, as a matter of fact. Okay, I'll take that one real quick, and then we'll come back to the first one. Um, the uh, can I find it very quickly here? <clears throat> Whoops. There we go. Yeah, this this one will do. This John Moss's or Joseph Landon's lake lot is number twenty nine here, and. This one, I don't have the photo. You should ask that question and I don't bring the photo. Um, this line between Lake Lots 29 and 30, north of Lakeshore Boulevard here, is quite visible, if you know you, the city of Euclid at all, is quite visible as the border between Sims Park and Garden Home Estates Apartments. It's a line you can actually go up and stand on that dates to uh, September 1796. That's the only one that's not a road that you can identify in the landscape. When, they, when, I, when I actually met, okay. was, were they later sold off in those allotments, in, that, in those narrow, long pieces? No, that system was entirely abandoned in 1802, okay. Okay. except for that one, except for Lake Lot 29. In fact, if you take a look at the uh, Connecticut Land Company records, there is a point in 1802 or 1801, they say something to the effect of the Euclid contract, as it were, has been a failure. Now, they don't actually call it the Euclid contract, and they allude to it as being a failure, and they reapportion it. 
It's redone in the schematic by 1802, and uh, it's a few years later that it's actually redistributed. There's actually record of a series of drafts that were taken or lots that were drawn, and so the uh, property was then redistributed at that point. Let's see if There we go. All right. This is, <clears throat> if you own property in Cleveland Heights and you have your title, you have your deed, okay, you can go look at it and you will see something that's on this map. This map dates to 1802. And the unsold land, the unsold surveyor's land is the white and it has numbers from one to two to three to four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to 20 here. Each of those tracts, they call them, is a thousand acres, okay? Those, all that, so that is 20 tracts of a thousand acres each, 20,000 acres reverted to the Connecticut Land Company, they, div they divided it like this, and they lotted it off to the remaining investors in 1802. That's what happened there. Now what you see here is land that in 1802 was owned by somebody, and that's John Moss, that's David Dilley, and that is um, Nathaniel Doan here. Don't yeah, brook. Any of those, because they were surveyors, they just bought it. These, well, it's a mixed bag here. Dilly was a Connecticuter. Um, there's a man named Kilgore who worked on the 1797 survey, who purchased part of this. This was owned by Amzi Atwater, a surveyor of 1796, but not a Euclid resident. Um, this also was owned by John Moss in 1802. And there's Nathaniel Doan, who was a surveyor. Okay, but that's about it for the own lands. So, um, uh, nearly 85% of the land was unsold in 1802. Yes? Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned Nine Mile Creek. Right. Where is that now? <laughs> that's one of the unfortunate, that's, We've treated our, all our water very poorly here, and it's really a shame because, especially in Cleveland Heights, now I don't want to single out Cleveland Heights as treating water poorly, but what I'd like to say about this is that, I'll get a better map. Right, this will be, this will be good. Nine Mile Creek, Nine Mile Creek has a sizable estuary down here, that is a sizable area on the, uh, on the shore of the lake where the water is at lake level and there's mixing between the lake and the stream. Euclid Creek has it, Nine Mile Creek has it, and Dugway Brook has a small one as well. Okay, Nine Mile Creek is the second largest stream in the township. Euclid Creek being the largest, okay, which goes right up to the southwest corner of the township, southeast corner. Um, Nine Mile Creek though, has a couple of branches, but Belvoir Boulevard follows Nine Mile Creek right. up to Cedar Road. It's under it. It's under it, right. And in fact, here we go. Belvoir Boulevard makes this sweep. Nine Mile Creek, Nine Mile Creek, a couple of branches. Nine Mile Creek to Cedar Road. Okay. So Nine Mile Creek is a very important one. It was the site of a couple of mill sites, also a couple of quarries. Okay. It's very unfortunate that almost all of Nine Mile Creek is now underground. Okay. And now, one of the things about, one of the things that I think is interesting about this, who could have thought, just maybe 10 years ago, that we would be removing dams from streams across the country to recreate natural stream courses, okay? This was inconceivable to me, and I think of myself as a kind of green person. But here we are in this new era. I think that in another 50 years, 70 years, who know how many years, we're going to be removing these streams from culverts. And I hope it happens. Now the thing is, you know Euclid Creek, the Euclid Creek Reservation, that gorge is pretty spectacular, okay? Nine Mile Creek had a smaller, shorter gorge down here, well at Belvoir, and um, Dugway Brook, you know, as the one branch of Dugway Brook passes through Lakeview Cemetery, that's nice landscape, 
Okay? Through Forest Hills Park, that's also nice. Imagine that without all of the amelioration, the grading, the culverting, everything that makes it easy for cars to climb uphill, right? Well, we've got a branch of Dudway right down the street. Right, the, the, the branch right here. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Kane Park is, uh, is also part of it. Well, these are, this, to me, this is where the future is. To me, this is why this kind of research is important. We can identify you know, our natural and cultural roots back here in the late 18th century, and we see what we have done for, you know, for reasons that made sense at the time, but we see now that it makes sense to restore a very interesting natural landscape here. So does that answer your question about Dugway Brook? <laughs> More. <laughs> yes. And she told me that when she was a girl, she lived on Euclid Avenue, just east of Ivanhoe, mm -hmm. and Belvoir Boulevard was not no, was a right. creek, was a river. That's right. And I just wondered if that was what she was talking about. It's an important one. And I'll say one more thing about Nine Mile. Creek. <clears throat> if you look in the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History, which is a very good book, uh, volumes one and two, and you look up Nine Mile Creek, it will say that the name comes from the fact that the mouth of Nine Mile Creek is nine miles from the Cuyahoga River. Absolutely impossible. No. <laughs> Not more than four miles from the Cuyahoga River, uh, maybe four and a half. Uh, Euclid Creek is not even nine miles from, from Public Square or the Cuyahoga River. Okay? And now the other thing is that as far as I can trace it out, unless you follow every little twist and turn of Nine Mile Creek, it's not nine miles long either. So I have no idea where the name Nine Mile comes from, but I know it doesn't come from its distance out uh, from the Cuyahoga or some other landmark. Continuing on the subject of rivers, uh, the yeah. flyer that I received uh, about the program tonight mentions the Hudson River. Is that the Chagrin River? Or what are you referring to? The, I don't know. The only reason the Hudson River might be mentioned is that, right, is that, Moses Cleveland and, and uh, Moses Cleveland and four of his men who started out from Connecticut had to cross the Hudson to get to Albany where they hired everybody else, where they hired another 50 some people. But that's Hudson, no, it's just maybe Hudson, Ohio. What does it say? What does it say? Right, okay. No, that the, the voyage of the surveyors, the journey, started at the Hudson in Albany and finished at the Cuyahoga. So they had this bad fortune. They lost, it actually, we said very little of it. They, they started from Albany with five seaworthy boats and 50 some people. And Joseph Tinker, for example, was the principal boatman. He had charge of uh, these five boats and the whole group went up the Mohawk River and the whole group had to portage these five boats uh, from the Mohawk into the Oswego River drainage, and then the five boats and about a dozen guys went down to Fort Oswego. There, the British garrison, in 1796, a British garrison at Fort Oswego held them for a month. Okay? So that was one of the misfortunes between the Hudson and the Cuyahoga. The next one is, the boatmen finally get out of Oswego Harbor and they run into a storm and they lose two boats, okay? And <clears throat> a lot of the provisions, which was surprisingly a lot of barreled whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> These, this whole thing has aspects of a mutiny, a mutiny because they were on, the surveyors were on a military type contract that you know, had essentially room and board as it was, but even a grog ration. And when they, when they protested, they were, likened to mutineers, okay? So there was that. There was the loss of equipment that was the second misfortune. In the meantime, and that's, that spelled another two weeks for the boatmen. So they were behind by six weeks. The rest of the group, Moses Cleveland and about 40 people, waited 
in Canandaigua, New York, with this competing company for six weeks, cooling their heels while they didn't know whether the boatmen were coming or not. Then they started across, then they ran into malaria, and they left their, well, this is not here, they left their provisions at Conneaut, and they went ever farther from Conneaut. They couldn't get back, and that's when they started eating rattlesnake and unripe berries and nuts and, and uh, came on with dysentery as well as malaria and had very poor conditions for the summer. That, that, so that's where the Hudson comes in. Misfortune between the Hudson and the Cuyahoga. Maintaining our water theme since it's become quite popular. Um, to your point earlier about uncovering riverbeds, uh, I just wanted to add that there's currently a proposal on the table to uncover Doan Creek as it runs through the University <laughs> Circle, yeah. which is uh, playing to a mixed audience, but nevertheless fits in with your observation. Mm -hmm. I was also curious, I'm not familiar with Manhattan Beach that you mentioned earlier on. Where in today's terms is Manhattan Beach? Okay. <laughs> well, I have to find the map. Back, back, back. Yeah, back. Here we go. All right. Uh, Manhattan Beach is at the, okay, very clearly, yes. Manhattan Beach is, all right, we have East 140th Street, and we have Lakeshore Boulevard. Lakeshore Boulevard is trending along the lakeshore, then it turns due east, and at the corner of 156, where the Commodore Theater is, it turns sharply north, okay, that area is Manhattan Beach. I suppose between between about 140th and 152nd is Just Man. Just west of Euclid Beach. Just west of Euclid Beach, right? Okay, and Euclid Beach obviously comes from Euclid. The the amusement park took its name from an older entity called Euclid Beach, right? Manhattan Beach, Euclid Beach, Moss Point, Wycliffe on Lake is another one of these. Is that the same White City Beach is exactly at 140th Street, East 140th, where the Easterly Sewage Treatment Plant is now. And that one is a little different. That takes its name from the amusement park that was there that I believe predated Euclid Beach. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, our interest is in the 18th century. Get us here into, <laughs> get us here into the early 20th. And you have done serious research on Euclid Township. Is there other research that has been done fairly recently using state-of-the-art technology on other townships in the Western Reserve or in process, or have you done any others? No, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can answer that. The, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, we both come to this because, um, I come to this because I'm a Euclid resident and Craig comes to it because he worked with the Euclid Historical Society. Okay, and we kind of channeled this interest into that. I'm an archeologist. I don't know really what's going on, but my impression is that most of the research that goes on in the townships of the Western Reserve at, at this point is large coffee table books, style books that give you lots of old photographs and like captioned history of these things. There are some very good ones. There's one for Mentor that's excellent, one for Aurora that's very good. Um, there is one, oh, I can't remember right now, but these things come out once in a while and they are, they're well done, but I wouldn't say that they're serious research, okay? But to me, this is good. This is good. You have to look at, at our region as one where we've all neglected it, okay? Our region we just haven't seen to be since the old days, since Charles Whittlesey and the people who really thought this was a fantastic area, New Connecticut, the Western Reserve, its own isolated area with its own cultural, architectural traditions, its own governmental forms and the like, and people going to Congress very early. Um, that kind of died down, and in the industrial era, we've kind of forgotten about our own region. Well, it comes back in a number of ways, and I think that the first stage may be these kind of coffee table books. But I hope that maybe ours represents a trend toward more serious research that, um, that will revitalize local history. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are two gentlemen... Uh I can only remember their last names, so Boberski and Stevens, and they, do, they have done some serious scholarly work on uh, other townships in the Western Reserve. 
Uh, there was a question about towns and townships. They do look at town forms and uh, the emergence of a distinctive Western Reserve town form or you know, a public square, as it were, rather than a town green or a common. And uh, that's among the things that uh, they do. They're affiliated with, I believe, the uh, Pioneer America Society. And one of them, and I forget which, is on the faculty at Youngstown State University. So that's... Do, do we know the names of the townships around Euclid Township? Sure. We do, and that's a very good question. And let's make in let's make this into the let's make this into a quiz. All right. I see Willoughby or probably my dad to the right there. All right. So here we are. This is not a good map, but we'll start easy. Class, what is to the west of Euclid Township? Cleveland, Cleveland Township. Cleveland. Right. No, there was never an East Cleveland Township. There was. Now, there's another, the second question, if you don't get, I'm walking out, okay? <laughs> what is the township south of Cedar Road, south of Euclid Township? Come on. Mayfield Township. Warrensville. Warrensville. Warrensville Township, here. Mayfield Township is, Mayfield Township is this one, okay? And that leaves us with this one, which has had a number of names. It's had three names altogether. Um, <clears throat> and the first one was Chapin. And that's a name that you find out toward the Chagrin River. The second one for it was Chagrin. And the third one is Willoughby. But the third one comes mid 19th century. Mm -hmm. So, and then this one. So what's this one then? And I, I don't even know what this one is here. So that would be T7R10. And uh, east of Warrensville, immediately east of Warrensville. Solon. Solon, that's right. Solon, no. Orange, orange. It would be Orange Township. Psalm Center, right. Solon, Orange Mayfield. That's right. There you go. Cleveland. Ah, the one we don't, we don't have. What's this one? Newburgh. Newburgh. Cleveland, Newburgh, Warrensville, Orange, Mayfield, Chapin, or Chagrin. And the Cleveland Township went how far west? 25 miles. No, five miles. Five, I mean five miles. Yeah. Um, can I do this? Let's see if I can find it. Right. I only went just west of the river. Um, where am I? Well, no, 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 I'm just going on here. I'm, I am. <laughs> I'm lost. I'm looking, actually, can you get me to the, um, uh, to this, you know, the full set? All, all 30 of them. I don't know which one I'm looking for by number, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, we, we want to go to... We want to go to... The full set. Set of four. One more to the right there. Okay. Now, we want to go to this one, number 19. <clears throat> Whoop. All right, so we have Cleveland Township is this gore. And actually, we'll look how it is. Here's the mouth of the Cuyahoga. So Cleveland Township was a strange one from, you know, from, uh, from the mouth of the Cuyahoga, essentially, up here to East 140th Street, down to Cedar, and across Cedar back to Public Square, essentially, or south of Public Square. That was Cleveland Township. And then Newburgh was a big one. Newburgh. Well, no, Newburgh looks big because it was skinny along the Cuyahoga. That's what we're looking at in that map. Ah. Western it's a very special part of the Western Reserve. This is Seth Pease's map done after the 1796 survey. 
1796, the survey team was limited to lands east of the Cuyahoga River. West of the Cuyahoga River, although theoretically part of the Western Reserve still, still not had been you know, taken basically from the Indians. Uh, theoretically, yes, but there was still disagreement with local populations. And so uh, the, the men were under strict orders not to go west of the Cuyahoga River, but Augustus Porter and about three others did go all the way to Sandusky Bay because they, they knew that this trend they wanted to figure out this trend of the lakeshore uh, because they were losing so much land. They wanted to go back to Hartford with an answer about this. So they, there were four of them who abandoned. That, that was one of the other problems, that there was this group of four people, including Augustus Supporter, who was the principal surveyor, the man second to Moses Cleveland in the whole thing, who abandoned his work out here running range lines to survey out to Sandusky and back. And that left them shorthanded. <clears throat> Cultural history, that's for your east side, west side thing. <laughs> there you go. Um, as an archaeologist, have you done any digs, or isn't that your area of archaeology? Um, digging is very much my area of archaeology, but for me, digging, the farther away from home it is and the older it is, the better. So I tend to work in places like Kenya and Indonesia, Java, and the like. Um, I am not a New World archaeologist. However, if I were, and someday I hope to have the chance to do some archaeology here, and if I had that chance, I'll tell you what I would go for first. It would be French trading posts east of Cleveland, and it would be, right, mm -hmm. and in particular, the one I would go for would be the, would be the um, one at the mouth of the Chagrin River, yeah, because that's really close to home. And there's one in the Cuyahoga Valley, but there's, there, are, there were quite a few. And in fact, there was a line of them along the south shore of Lake Erie, and we generally don't know much about them. I did, and I, my interest in this is that I work a lot in France, and I spend a lot of time in France, so I, would, uh, I could do the background research um, there. And there must be a lot, because the French were very systematic about where they placed people to have trading posts. And all of these along the south shore of Lake Erie, I'll just tell you, were headquartered in Detroit. They were single men who left the big French settlement at Detroit to come out and establish small trading posts. Hmm. Well, we want to thank uh, these gentlemen for coming tonight. It was a great presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Now, as they asked, uh, please um, let them know if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book that they have coming out. Uh, I think they'd be interested in hearing about that. Anybody wants to help us get in that, that into the schools or into the libraries, um, let's hear from that too. Uh, on your way out, if you're interested, uh, there are some green slips on the bench going out that are for the membership uh, drive, members of the uh, Cleveland Heights Historical Society looking for people to, uh, to join the organization, help support uh, events like this. Um, and uh, I think if you have any other informal questions you might want to ask these gentlemen tonight, we can do that. But thanks very much for coming.